Um, anyhow, what I was alluding to a moment ago is if we're going to really understand all of this in, a, in the context in which we should as reality, somehow we have to not just focus on supernovas and comets and all of this business. We have to focus on what we call God. And, and that's really a difficult one because we, we, we get right into the very point of saying, do you believe in God? And, and if we say that, then we have to look back on all of the years that we've been taught about something called God. We've gone to churches, we've gone to Bible studies, we've, many have gone to religious schools, and here we are talking about supernovas and Edicarinas and all of this kind of business that have connections to the Bible, which would have connections to God. And so we're left with the most important part of this whole thing and unable to conclude whether there even is such a thing. We don't know. This, you know. To me, and I have to just speak for myself now, if someone says to me, do you believe in God? then I have to say no, because there is no such thing. And that's extremely hard. I mean, how, how do you even sit down and say, oh, yeah, yeah, you have to believe in God. First of all, the word God is an English word created out of the word good. That's where it came from. It's the word good with an O missing. The word devil is the word evil with a D on it. And so we have good versus evil. That's where it came from. There is no other culture in the universe that recognizes the word God. Uh, most other cultures have a name for this thing. Some people call it Allah, some people call it Krishna, some people call it Adam, all different kinds of things. But as far as the word God is concerned, it's strictly a Western European type of, of word. And there is, if you go into the, if you were to go into the galaxies or whatever, you would not find anything or anybody or any entity who has that name. You couldn't find it. If you left this planet and went somewhere and said, I'm looking for God, there's, anyone you would meet would just stare at you because there is no such thing. What are you talking about? So if I am asked, do you believe in God, I have to say then you're talking about the character that was invented by Western religious cultures, and the answer is no. I say, well, how? Because we're, in order for us to think about supernovas in, in the context that we're talking here, we have to think about a supreme being. Now, here's where I have a problem with religion in, in our culture. We have been raised to think of a supreme human being. And yet the very book that we've been raised with says specifically this thing called God is not a man and is light. So then we have now, okay, if we, we could leave here with a whole new paradigm. If we could create a whole new thought pattern and say, no, I don't believe in God. And I don't believe in a supreme human being but I am fascinated by what I think would be provable existence of a supreme light being. <coughs> and the a funny thing about that is if you came to that conclusion, then you would be in harmony with the very Bible that is cherished, a supreme light being. Well, because it says in the Bible, God is not a man, God is light, God is the supreme being. So we're not talking about God. So we just throw the whole word away, God, because that was invented. And we're talking about the existence of a supreme light being. Everything that you have ever heard or everything that you have ever been taught in your life about something called God required faith. I've attended all kinds of services, and I'm sure you have, all kinds of meetings, Bible studies, I've seen television programs, but in every case where this entity called God is concerned, the bottom line 
is faith. No one, absolutely no one, in thousands of years of Western recorded religion has proved one thing. Nothing. And yet we flock to these places. Why? We don't know what else to do and wonder if they're right. Because the way that you control people is very important to do it. If you want them to believe something, you put a threat next to it. If you don't believe it, something bad is going to happen to you. Well, maybe, maybe. I mean, and this is, this is how gullible we, you know, as people are. We say, well, maybe something bad will happen to us, so we better believe that. And then you tie it into traditions, you tie it into nationalities, and, the, and, and what you've manufactured is a supreme cult of people who haven't a clue. Everybody flocks in, they haven't a clue, and they're looking at somebody standing at a pulpit who hasn't a clue. And they're all convincing each other of an existence of something whose name they made up. So you wander down the stairs here, or you turn the television on and watch this thing. And the reason that I assume that you're even sitting here looking at me is because you have listened to years and years of the same thing and nobody's ever proven it to you. God really loves you. He really does. What? I was talking to Dot this morning. What is it, 100,000 people just died in Mozambique? A woman had a baby up in a tree and kids are... Where is it? And all the wonderful nations of the world who can get helicopters to the battlefield in 10 minutes can't get one to take people out of a tree that are, you know. Where is, the, where is Jesus? Loves the little children. They're all drowning to death in a place called Mozambique. God loves you. And God expects this, you know. God wants you to have a personal relationship with Who said that? Some guy standing up here made it up. But he knows. No one has proof of anything, absolutely nothing. And you have gone in and out of churches all of your life, and you've, some of you, you've knelt and you've prayed and you've done this and that, and now you wind up here because nobody has ever proved the existence of anything but fear. Scared the hell out of you, really did, or scared the hell into you, but proved nothing. And then we try... Since we figure, well, religion doesn't, I mean, they don't prove it, so we go to the New Age. We have the New Age music. And I admit it's much more peaceful, much more peaceful. It's more nature-centered. But I find a problem with it. Because New Age people, if you ever get on the websites, they have a, a, a thing, I guess it's a fetish or something, of writing paragraph after paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of oblivion of all of these things of we have to be open, we have to be guided, if we, and, and it goes on and on and on, and, it, and, it, and you wind up at the very bottom and it says, I leave you in peace and all this, and, noth and nothing's been said. And nothing's been, you've read for hours and they haven't said anything. Haven't proved anything. Ramblings about spiritual entities, lights, comets, beings, wind up, and, and you're in the same place as you were before, but instead of, uh, of having, uh, you know, crosses, you've got uh, crystals. So actually, the same thing. There's no proof. Maybe, maybe this is right. Maybe this is wrong. But in any case, I can't do anything about that. So, you know, we'll all go through the motions and whatever will be, will be, and that's basically where you're at. What can you do about it? <coughs> so in this room, we began to look again at the Bible. We looked at Buddha. We looked at Krishna and the Bhagavad Gita. We studied Allah, the Muslims, with Ahmad Halusi, all of this stuff. And now there's a lot of interesting stuff. We, we did have a lot of interesting stuff. What happened? You had to go home still with the same thing. You know, that was nice. Nice room, you know, they got, look, they got trees and everything, yeah, it was nice. It didn't mean anything to you, it didn't change, it didn't change your life at all. Just nice. But there's no proof. I mean, you, you get to the point, of how many books are you going to carry with you? How many tapes are you going to listen to? Somebody somewhere has got to start proving something. 
Nobody can prove God exists. Because in the first place, <coughs> the very word that identifies this being God is, is, is a word of our culture. It doesn't even exist in other parts of the world. Nobody can prove that Jesus ever existed. Oh, I believe that. Well, that's one to, I, I, I'm not quabbling with anybody's beliefs. I want, I'm just saying prove it. I want proof. This is the most important, critical thing in, in, in your existence, and yet you said, well, you'll have to have faith. Why? You don't have to have faith that the sun is shining. It either is or it isn't. You don't have to have faith that it's, somebody says it's raining out. Oh, I don't feel anything. Well, you have to have faith. What do you mean you have to have faith? You either get wet or you don't. So why do you have to have faith in the most important thing in the world? Why can't somebody prove it? And right now, even the politicians are arguing about it. The religious right or the religious left or whatever, and they're all screaming, you know, because it's all politics, votes. One guy goes and speaks at a university, and they don't like blacks and whites, and they don't like Catholics, and, and he doesn't say anything, and then he leaves, and, and, and then somebody else says, oh, you went there, and they, oh, well, I, I should have, and all this kind of stuff. All about what? About something that doesn't even exist? Something that nobody knows even exists, and it's a big deal in politics. Because why? It has nothing to do with God. It has to do with traditions. It has to do with your family. It has to do with your politics. And my revolution, my personal revolution in this life was based on my need not to follow other people unless they could substantiate what they were telling me. Don't Tell me something is very important if you cannot prove what you're saying. Because I've, I've had enough of that. I don't want to hear somebody else's opinion about something called God until first you can prove to me that that something called God is there. Because the very Bible that I carry with me and, and read too tells me that I am not dealing with something that is a man, so I am not dealing with a human being. Can you imagine? Think of that. You've got to, you've got to talk to God, but God's not a human being. What in the world are you talking to? You want to kneel down in front of the light bulb and talk to the bulb? Because it says God is light. Get a neon light and talk to it. But you know what? If you really, really believe the Bible, that's exactly what you're going to have to do because it says that's what it is. The supreme being is a supreme light being. So you have to communicate with light. And nobody in all of the years that you've ever gone to church has ever told you how to do that. They made it into a supreme human being and it doesn't exist. I mean, if you're going to tell me something, at least give me a neutral source to back up what you say. <coughs> Give me a neutral source to back up what you say. I don't want you to refer me to religious books to back up religious claims. Somebody say, well, you're wrong about this. How do you know I'm wrong about it? Because it says in 1 Matthew or Matthew 26, 35. I don't want to hear that. Tell me of a neutral source who is not religious and not new age and can prove what you say. And I don't want to be referred to New Age books or people who agree with New Age claims. If your claims are true, then you should be able to back them up using neutral sources who are not religious and who are not New Age, because either it is or it isn't. If it's based on faith, goodbye. I don't want to hear about it. Unfortunately, in our culture, many people believe what is, is what they wish it to be. This is the way I want it to be, so this is the way I believe it is. So, we start from a premise that there are physical animals. Check your hands, see if that, you've got one. I see most of you have, yeah. Physical animals and an earth. God. Look, excuse the expression, look what we've done. We've proved it. I can see you sitting there, so I know there are physical, I don't want to use 
animals, but there are physical beings, and there is a planet Earth. You know how I know there's a planet Earth? Because I walk on it, and grass grows out of it. We can prove it, because you're there, and I'm here, and we have cats and dogs and everything. That was pretty easy. There are physical animals, and there is a planet Earth. Are you all agreed to that? Is there anybody who say, no, that doesn't exist? <coughs> Raise your hand, that doesn't exist, and show me, certainly it does. Now, the next thing that we have to do in our search to prove the supreme being exists is that there is a universe for this planet Earth and for us to fly around in. Have you been out and seen the sunshine? Has anybody ever seen the sun? Have you seen the moon? Do you get a telescope and you see all these little things? What? Mm. Constellations and planets? So there's no doubt about it. We've proved it. There is a planet Earth. There is physical life walking around the Earth. And there is a universe out there. We have proof. Congratulations. We have proof. But now things start to get tacky. God, angels, devils, UFOs, aliens, saints. Now we start to tread in areas where there is absolutely no physical proof of any kind. Nothing. People say they saw this or they saw that, but they cannot prove a thing. And they always use sources to support their claims of people who are in agreement with them and the type of philosophy they have. <coughs> so we have to back off a little bit, don't we? Because maybe our proof in this realm of what we call God has to be a little more circumstantial. What I mean is that suggesting that something that was part of our culture think of that, or written by someone thousands of years ago actually meant something can be proven by the things that exist on the earth. Now, now wait a minute, wait a minute, a lot of words here. Now, what I'm saying is we've proved that there are living things on the earth, we've proved that there is an earth, and we've proved that there's a universe because we've seen all of this stuff. Now, what I'm saying is I'm proposing to you a possibility that something that was written, words that were written many thousands of years ago, would use those very things to prove the existence of this supreme light being. Now, because all we have is the existence of the earth and physical life in the universe, we have to begin to put things under a microscope, like Albert did as a scientist. We have to spread out a jigsaw puzzle and see if things fit. Does this fit here? Does this make sense here? Is this possible here? <coughs> you know, if you have a jigsaw puzzle, you open a box and there's, it's all chaos. So, until you start putting all the pieces together, and then you start, did you ever do it when you were a kid, a little jigsaw puzzle? Say, hey, look, I think that's a tree. Or I think that's a dog, or I think it's a cow, or whatever. And then as you start putting all the pieces together, you see the picture. This is what we're doing. But our goal here is to develop proof for what is. In other words, the most ultimate beautiful thing that you will have happen to you by coming here is finally have proof of the existence of the supreme light being. And that's even comfortable for you because you walk and say, what? Who, who does he mean the supreme light being? I'm talking what the Bible says. The supreme light being, the one that you have called God. But remember and remember and remember and remember, not a man, not a human being. If you are going to pray to God, you cannot use human things, you have to go on the same level of what this is, and that is a light being. So it must be light to light. In other words, you have to do it their way instead of your way and my way. So whatever I say then, whatever you've got in your hands, whatever kind of books you have, whatever kind of books you've read, Whatever anybody told you, unless there is proof, it's just somebody's opinion. 
and it may be right, but it may be wrong. Nothing anyone ever said in the past matters unless there is proof to support what they say. So whatever I say, standing here, is simply an opinion until there's proof. And if it's just an opinion, you're no better off here than in any other church or any other New Age meeting. It's just a bunch of baloney. More ramblings on with no proof of anything. Who needs it? So we take all of the old texts. We have the Bible. We have the Bhagavad Gita of Krishna. We have the Sutras of Buddha. <coughs> we have the Quran of Muhammad and all of this business. And then we have to say, is any of this stuff relevant to anything? I mean, you're dealing with mortgages, you're dealing with doctors, you're dealing with insurance companies, you're dealing with gasoline, you're dealing with what the heck is all of this? Who cares about these crazy people that wrote all of this stuff? Is there anything in any of these writings that you could prove? Well, you've, I don't know, I'd like to find out how, how many years have you gone to church, whatever church you go to, and then I would ask you again, you know, has at any time they ever proved anything to you? And somebody said, well, I, my sister had a healing or whatever. And if it is generally known, the answer is no, because everything is subject to interpretation. We say that this group is going to hell because they don't believe the way we do. They say that we're the devils, and somebody else says that both of these are wrong because they do this, and somebody else says that's wrong, and this is wrong, and there's a million, they're all... Nobody knows. It's all subject to interpretation. Whatever the reader thinks it means, it what it means to the reader, but it doesn't prove anything. You can read the Bible. Somebody else could read the Bible, and you could have 40 people read it, and 40 people could come away thinking it means something completely different. It's like Shakespeare said, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. It depends. But you can't simply discount those texts. You can't just simply throw those things in the garbage because <coughs> nothing's been proven to now. You have to rethink how you're using that text, and then you have to say, well, maybe it does mean something that can be proven. No longer reading. I am not going to read the Bible anymore. I am not going to read this book, and I am not going to read that book, and I am not going to read any of this stuff unless I can put it down and then go see if I can prove it. Do you know that's what I do with everything that comes in front of me? My first point is, I've seen it. Interesting. Now, can I prove it? Let me give you an example of a biblical text that says that you can prove, quote unquote, spiritual things by looking at physical things. Would you put on overhead B11, and we'll, we'll take a look at that. B11, right here, you have to raise it, John. Romans 1.20, for the invisible things of him of what? Of it, from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even eternal power in Godhead, so they're without excuse. So in other words, everybody's running around trying to dream up things and are not looking at things. And I, when I started looking at the things of nature, people would say, well, you're worshiping the creation instead of the creator. I'm not worshiping anything. Look at it. The invisible things, the things you've been trying to find out all your life, <coughs> are understood by the things that you can see. Yes? That's like the Platonic idea of the chair. Mm -hmm. The idea of the chair is in the ether, and the chair is right in front of mm -hmm. you, so I don't see any contradiction there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. The invisible things are understood by the things that are made. Okay. So there is a religious statement, a religious document that says invisible things of quote-unquote God can be understood by looking at physical things. And the point is, is this true? <coughs> can we prove this? Well, no one has ever done that, but it's worth a shot. 
But since we need some guidance, don't we? And since no one on the earth has proven anything for, about God, where do we go for this guidance? I mean, who's going to guide us into... We obviously have to take things that are written by others whose credentials can be proved by matching what they say with the things that are seen. In other words, we will look at the Bible, and we'll see if we can prove things by finding physical things to back up words. We have words, we have words, and we have to back up those words with physical. So the words would kind of be the invisible things, and the physical would have to be the proof. Because if we do that, then we're following that and we're obeying it. Okay. We have to be able to do that. And that's OK. But we live in a very sophisticated society of computers and atomic energy. So how can we possibly listen to people who wrote things when there was no electric lights, no cars, no computers, no planes? How can they tell us anything? And if they do tell us something, why should we even consider it? <coughs> we're much more advanced than they were. There is a story in the Bible of the supreme light being, if you would. You call it God. Removing a rib from a guy named Adam. And I couldn't prove it. And do you know what? I, I heard that story all of my life, and nobody ever proved that it happened. Nobody ever proved it. <laughs> I certainly can't prove that you could take a rib out of somebody else's body and use it to make another human being. You know why? Because you can't. Unless the words mean something else. If this is kind of mythology in which the words mean something else, then maybe we could do something with it. Well, if I look at that book, it says God speaks in parables. It says wisdom is understanding the dark sayings of the ancients. It says the Old Testament is an allegory. It says you should not be a minister of the letter. So if we are really going to use that book and we're going to work with that book, let's try it. And let's not take the stuff literally, and let's see what happens. See if we can prove anything. God, whatever that is, takes a rib, whatever that is, out of Adam, whatever that is, and makes Eve, whatever that is. OK? God takes a rib out of Adam and makes Eve. What I want to do is change this to Adam, A-T-O-M. Not just because it sounds, but because of, you know, God takes something out of an Adam and uses it to make something else that's female called Eve. And do you know why it's so interesting? Because we can prove it. Let me show you over at 50. There's an atom. They take an electron out of the atom here, and this becomes what they call a positive ion. They take that electron and put it in the atom here, this becomes a negative ion. You have just created the two becoming one, male and female, positive, negative, yin and yang. In other words, what the biblical story could be construed as saying is that when you take from Adam and put into another Adam, you create an ionic bond. The two become one, male and female, husband, one wife, whatever you want to do. So we have proof that if not taken literally, then the Bible can be correct. If you take it literally, 
then you have to have faith. You can never prove it. And yet, the scripture we saw a moment ago said the things, the invisible things are proven by the things that you see, so we should be able to prove it. And in fact, I want no part of it unless we can prove it. And if being able to prove it then takes you into an entirely different realm of communion with the supreme light being, that's what you want. And I'll tell you something else about this and about what's in the Bible. Whoever wrote that knew of nuclear fission, ionic exchange, long before their time. So what have we done? We've taken something written about the invisible. We've looked at something that exists, as the Bible instructed us to do, and came up with a logical meaning to this. But more than that, we proved that whoever wrote this thing was of an advanced race. We've proved it. So if nothing else, you know that somebody that wrote in the Bible about this kind of a thing, if this is true, is of an advanced civilization, of an advanced race. So we can prove that removing an electron from one atom and placing it in another causes the result that the Bible speaks of. So then we've looked at physical things, we see how they work, we connected it to the biblical things, and we followed the biblical instruction for finding proof. Let's look at B11 once again. Of what we just saw. The invisible things are seen being understood by the things that are made. We just looked at something physical, we connected it to something that is implied as spiritual, and we proved it. Not only did we prove that it's correct, but we proved that whoever wrote it is from an advanced race. And we understand the biblical thing by proving it as a scientific thing, and also that makes us consider the intelligence of the writer. Let's try it again. I'm going to take that off there. In Numbers chapter 2, verse 9, it says that Judah had 186,400 people in its camp. Judah is referred to in the Bible as the tribe of light, the people of light. 186,400 is the constant speed of light. What have we proved? We have proved that it is speaking of light, and in speaking of light, the Bible may very well have been speaking of cosmic or interstellar light because the interstellar speed of light through the universe is 186,400 specified. Well, you may say, well, that's a coincidence, and it may be, but since light and 186,000 are so specific, I think we should give the benefit of the doubt. Isn't it more interesting to you that you've read the Bible all of your life and you've gone to Bible studies and Bible teachers and Bible preachers and they said 186,000 uh, were people who were in the tribe of Judah and nobody ever stopped to say, oh, curious, that's the speed of light. And God is light. Wouldn't that be curious? Don't you think it's interesting? And again, the writer who wrote that knew the speed of light. What have we seen? We saw, first thing, whoever wrote knew the concept of ionic bonding and nuclear fission, and now we find somebody who knew the speed of light, and it's in the Bible. One last one. God lives in a temple not made with hands. Can I tell you something? That the only temple that is not made with hands is on top of your shoulders. And if you take your finger that is physical and put it right here, you'll find it. The temple not made with hands is your head. The biblical temple has an outer room, an inner holy of holies, and the two are separated by a veil or a curtain. Your head has an outer covering of the brain called dura mater, the innermost sensitive part is called pia mater, and the two are separated by arachnid, which is the web or the veil or the curtain. So we have an anatomically correct description of a human brain written thousands of years ago in the Bible. By not taking it literally, we have proven it correct. And what about the writer who knew of the construction of the human brain thousands and thousands of years ago? 
We have somebody who knew anatomy of the brain. We have somebody who knew the speed of light. <coughs> we have somebody who knew of nuclear fission and ionic bonding written in a book thousands of years ago. And the important thing is that of all the churches and all the religious groups that you've gone to all of your life taught you about that, nobody ever caught it. So it seems we have followed a pattern of considering ancient writers as being an advanced race and their statements showing links between the physical, the anatomical, your body, and the astronomical of the things we have proved. So if an advanced race was writing this material and they spoke of cosmic events, they would obviously know what they're talking about, I would think, because I'm looking at the same people that told you about atoms. I'm looking at the same people that told you about nuclear fission. I'm looking at the same people that told you about the speed of light. <coughs> I'm looking at the same people that gave you an anatomically correct description of the human brain. I'm looking at people who wrote this thousands of years ago, and I'm looking at now saying these are the same ones who told you about supernova and Eta Carina. In other words, I had to establish their credibility before we go on to what they have said. Because, my friends, what is looming very, very close and closer than ever before is the advent into your midst of a character by the name of Samael. And it's important that you know, first of all, that you can trust what was written by these advanced civilizations who wrote it. Someone who spoke of nuclear fission, speed of light, the brain thousands of years ago would seem to be the beings that we should be listening to. When they spoke of a special happening in Revelation, they connected it to a white horse. Behold, heaven opened, and I saw a white horse. Religious as can be. But did anybody in your experience, in any church, in any religious, in any biblical group, ever connect it to the winged white horse Pegasus? We found it to mean Pegasus, and then found circumstantial proof as the first planet that was discovered orbiting its own star was found in the sign of the winged white horse Pegasus happened in 1995. And then we took a step further and found that the Pegasus in the sky had the exact same function from the writers as the hippocampus in your brain. The point of memory. We were proving that there was something identified Pegasus as with the goddess of memory. One of these people who wrote like the nuclear fission said Pegasus was connected with the goddess of memory and then we found that somebody put a name on an organ in your brain responsible for memory called the hippocampus which is a winged white horse Pegasus. So whoever put the identification of that power in the sky put the identification of that power in your head. So there is a hippocampus and we can prove that. And there is a Pegasus, and we can prove that. But the beautiful part is that the advanced race, we're talking about the light beings, wrote both of them connected to memory. So looking at the physical, we proved that the spiritual, or at least the mystical, does exist. Then Supernova 1987A. We stopped in our tracks because it was shown on the front cover of National Geographic, and it looked like a single eye of the ancient writings. And then we looked in the Bible in Matthew 6, 22, that Jesus says, if your eye be single, <coughs> your body will fill with light. There's no doubt about that. That's in the Bible. We proved that in the Bible. And we looked at Supernova 1987A, and there was the green single eye peering out from the center of that supernova. Do you have that number 36? No, I don't want to look at that. I, no, I, no, I was just going to look at the color picture of supernova. We proved it's in the Bible. It talks about the single eye. If your eye be single, your body will fill with light. We proved that it's in the sky. 
But where we had a little bit of problem was proving that one had anything to do with the other. In other words, we did not prove that supernova and the single eye of what Jesus spoke of had anything to do with you physically. Let me just show you again for those of you who might be seeing this for the first time. If you can zoom in on that as quick, close as you can. There is the single eye. Okay, supernova 1987. Wait, just keep, keep zooming in. Let that thing go until it just stops dead. Okay, there. Now you see the eye in the center. The green eye in the center. This is on the front page of National Geographic. Jesus in the Bible says, if your eye be single, your body will fill with light. There's supernova 1987A with a single eye peering out from its center. Curious. Curious. And so I looked at that, and to me it became interesting. Because as Joan was just showing you on overhead B24, here's Jesus in the Bible on overhead B24 saying, if your eye be single, your whole body will be full of light. So there is something that's in the Bible, talking about the invisible, there is something that's in the sky that we can see and we can prove exists out there and we can connect it to. And then we go back to the part that says the invisible things are proved by the visible. Well, there's the single eye in the Bible, there's the single eye in the sky. And you know what? There's not one religious person who's ever even noticed that it's there. The thing that Jesus told them to look for, they missed. Now, using the system that we've set up here, to look at this carefully, we have determined a distinct possibility that an advanced civilization wrote these things. If that is so, we would want to consider the single eye in light for one very important reason. We talked about God before. Look at overhead B8 <coughs> in 1 John 1, 5, which is right here. The message we have heard and declare unto you, God is light. <coughs> All right, it's good. This is why I say, when you get into your prayer time and you get into communicating with God and understanding God, you can't understand God until you understand light. God is light. So there, whatever you consider God to be, Heavenly Father, Supreme Being, All-Wise Creator, the statement here from an advanced race is, you better start rethinking this and think of it in the realm of light, because that's what it is. Hmm. Now, the other statement that we saw a moment ago, that if, if you practice the single eye, if you stimulate the pineal gland of the brain, you'll fill with light, or now we'd have to say you'll fill with God. How? By praying? No. By getting saved? No. By joining a church? No. How? By bringing light into your body? How? Via the what? Single eye that Jesus spoke of, the pineal gland. Rene Descartes, who was a famous French philosopher, reached a conclusion. He said that the pineal gland was the place where God and man met. He considered the pineal gland to be the seat of the soul. <clears throat> in all ancient cultures, the single eye carries the mystical power of the universe. If you look on the back of a $1 bill, did you ever look on the back of a $1 bill? See the single eye? You'll find it as the separated capstone of the pyramid. The word pyramid, incidentally, means fire in the center. The energy flowing upward from the spine to the pineal gland. But the all single eye is not limited to the Bible. The all-single eye and the all-seeing eye is not limited to the back of a one-dollar bill or to the pyramid. The all-seeing eye of Horus is an important part of the mythology surrounding the power of the single eye. And I want to show you this in the encounter of Aradamus and the eye. Do you want to lift that up, John? Aradamus and the eye. Aradamus gazed long upon the wonderful sight for he knew that it was the eye of Horus. Now, what this was, this is why I want you to look. Did you see the eye looking at you from Supernova 1987A? If you, if you didn't get a good look at it, come up, I'll show it to you again. The eye of Horus, the all-seeing eye of the gods, as he stood there, he prayed that he will of the God, that the will of the gods might be made known unto him. 
and that in some way he might be found worthy to open that closed eye in the temple of the living God. The closed eye is your pineal gland. And you open it in meditation, which is the temple, remember, not made with hands. As he stood there gazing upward, the eyelids suddenly flickered. Then as the great orb slowly opened, the chamber was filled with a dazzling light that seemed to consume the very stones with fire. Let me tell you this. As you're sitting here right now, the scientists have said that the great eye of supernova has flickered and opened long before they had anticipated that it would. And it will not fill a chamber in a room with dazzling light that will consume the very stones. It will fill the earth with this very light that will consume the very stones. That word fire is electromagnetism. Aradama staggered. It seemed as though every atom of his being was scorched by the effulgence of that blinding glow. He instinctively closed his eyes now he feared to open them, for in that blaze of splendor it seemed that only blindness would follow his actions. It was so bright. Little by little, a strange feeling of peace and calm descended on him, and at length he dared to open his eyes only to find that the glare was gone. The entire chamber was bathed in a soft, wondrous glow from the mighty eye in the ceiling. The change had come. The peace had come. The healing had come from the eye. And you cannot sit any longer, even two minutes, not realizing what is happening with Supernova 1987A. The pineal gland of the brain. God is light. Look at overhead B8 again. Genesis 3230, and Jacob called the name of the place Pineal, for I have seen God face to face. <coughs> I want to just show you something before we, we go on, because there is so much, but it's important to show you just this, okay? We had the... Um, First, uh, John, I'm going to skip a little bit because it, it's running late and I've got to wrap up. Um, overhead 154. Overhead 154 <coughs> was from Hubble, was talking about the eye, which is supernova 1987 uh, 7A. The first explosion was supposed to be 2002. The second final explosion was supposed to be <coughs> 2005. 2002, 2005, okay? So that would give you some time. Will you listen to me? Will you look at me? There has been a change. It is a change that I will have to prove to you because the eye has begun to flicker. The eyelid is flickering, and it would appear that the cosmic pineal is lighting up. Would you look at overhead 229? We're, we're, we're jumping to this, and I've got to carry it again, but I, I don't want you to leave here without saying it. See the date on this? February 16th, 2000, from Hubble. Onset of Titanic collision lights up supernova ring. And leave it down, Joan, thank you. Uh, Hubble Space Telescope is giving astronomers a ringside seat to a never-before-seen violent celestial main attraction. The knockout event is the collision of the fastest moving debris from an immense stellar explosion seen first in 1987. You could see what it had been looking like up until a few weeks ago, like this. You can see what it looks like now. The eye is flickering. The all-seeing eye of Horus is opening, and it is about to bathe you 
and this earth in its light and fire. I want to just show you one other thing here. Um, so you don't have two or three years now. I want to show you overhead 234. This is uh, from CNN. Go all the way down to the bottom as far as you can go. I don't know if I got I All right, just come back down, John. I thought I had a, a date on here. But anyhow, it's CNN, Baltimore, Maryland, CNN. The Hubble Space Scope has given scientists a great view of the spectacular fire show. Okay. Uh, 13 years after they spotted the supernova, a blast wave has begun to light up a gas ring around the fallen star. Hubble team members released new images of the titanic collision this week. Um, would you come down, Joan, just a minute? Look at this here. You want to talk about what this is? This is the way they call it, tied in bright knots. The slugfest will begin. Um, let me just show you one last one. Uh, this is 235, June. 235. Hubble scientist Robert Kirchner called the first bright knot the opening jab. Now the dancing around is over and the slugfest will begin, said Kirchner, astronomer with the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Astronomers figured the violent collision was only a matter of time, based on Hubble observations of the earlier shock wave. Hubble team members don't know how many additional beads will light up the ring, but they expect quite a show over the next decade. We'll just have to see, wait and see what lights up. But the fact that new ones have lit up suggests that much of the surface is ready to light up. And the point here is if your eye be single and your body will fill with light, what happens to the universe eye lighting up and filling with light, filling with God? Is there a single eye up there? We have proved that there is. Is it mentioned in the Bible and ancient mythologies? We have proved that it is. Is it sending elements to the earth that affect human beings? We have proved that it is. Is it connected to DNA? We have proved that it is. Is the eye lighting up brighter now? We have proved that it is. And the changes that will come upon the earth, both with Eta Carina and Supernova, will be awesome. This is light. Why? And I plead with the people of the churches. Why have Bibles? Why read scriptures? If when the prophecies are fulfilled in the sky by the signs that the very Bible said, let there be lights in the heavens and let them be for sight, why will you not look up? Why will you not look up when it says, look up for your redemption draweth nigh? Why do you refuse it? Why are you afraid? Give me three minutes. The changes that will come upon the earth with Eta Carina and Supernova will be awesome. This is light. This is God. But someone else is coming. The electricity, which will be a form of current impacting the body, will be regulated. If you will look with me to this at overhead 60. In overhead 60, this has come from Blavatsky's work many years ago. As he passed over Peniel, the sun rose upon him and Jacob halted upon his thigh. That was just after he said, I have seen God face to face and I will call the place Peniel. Israel, Jacob, opposed by his brother Esau, is Samael. And the names of Samael are Azazel and Satan, the opposer. See the origin of the word Sama, meaning current. Sama L is current, opposition, resistance, impedance. Measures the degree of the electric circuitry is impressed across its terminal. Impedance is expressed in ohms, which is the most sacred literature of Hinduism, and so forth and so on. So those who are flowing in ohms, 
in meditation will flow upward with the proper current to light the pineal to allow the entrance of God at this time of the great supernova and great Eta Carina. Now let me tell you something. Please listen to me. Those who do not, and I will promise you this, and I will promise the churches this, those who do not will encounter Samael. The eye in the sky is flickering. The eye is opening. As Robert Kirchner said, the dancing around time is over. Let the slugfest begin. Something is going to happen. What does he mean by slugfest? There is going to be violence in the sky between the two powers of the uh, ring and the debris around the ring colliding. This tremendous explosion, this tremendous violence is going to happen. But the important point is, and I just didn't have time this morning because of the constraints. The important point is, we have proved to you that the life-giving elements that make it possible for you to live come from these things. We have proved to you that explosions of stars cause DNA to come down upon the earth. And who was the person that proved it? What was his name? Sanali was his first name. His last name was Chakrabarty. And he's a scientist. Those who do not obey Jesus by practicing the single eye, obey Jesus by watching within themselves, obey Jesus by separating from the thoughts of the mind, will meet Samael. And Samael is on his way now. He has been dispatched. And there is fire in his eyes. He is the boatman Sharon, who will take you either to Elysium or to the place of the howling, which will come upon this earth as well. And I beg of you, in light of this coming light, to take your meditation seriously. I have shown you, I want to get you out of here because I'm over my time, but let me just show you one thing that is the scary part of this and why Samael is ticked and why the forces of light are not going to just do good things, although they are. I'll just show you one last overhead, which is overhead 236. And then we'll leave and we'll get out of here. But this is from ABC News. Just came out. Genetic code landlords. Is business getting in the way of good scientific research? Exactly what we talked about. And I think, Don, you were the first one to raise the problem, the question. <coughs> and what this is saying is that there are businesses right now that are taking out patents on various chromosomes in your body and that when scientists want to find a way, uh, a particular chromosome to cure cancer, they're going to have to get permission from some company in order to be able to do it. So it's big, 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 big trouble here. It's a lot like the old gold rush days, staking claims, hunting for treasure up in the hills, except this time the treasure isn't in the hills. The treasure is in you. And then it goes on to talk about if you can figure out even roughly any particular group of these chemicals in a human being, the United States government will reward you with a U.S. patent. Once the patent issues, for 17 years you own this strip of DNA, and if science want to work on it, you can charge them rent. And let me tell you something, Samael is coming down, that universe is coming down, the all-seeing eye of God is lighting up, and your business as usual collapses inevitable. So it's a, it's a most interesting time. But it's not just a time of great joy because of the healings coming upon the earth. It is a time when each one of us have to be very, very careful and have to begin to flow in the harmony with this meditation. And how do we know? Because we proved it. OK, thank you very much for being with us. And uh, <coughs> we'll look forward to seeing you uh, again real soon. Bye-bye. Okay, um, I, I, time, I, I was hoping that we do have to cover some.